Hello, and thank you all for attending today. My name is Nicole Jarvis. I'm Assistant Director of Programs at Cancer and Careers, and I'll be today's host for the webinar. Uh, just before we begin, a couple of housekeeping items related to accreditation. Uh, the webinar today is accredited for CEUs by ANCC, NASW, the New York State Education Department State Board for Social Work, the California Board of Registered Nursing, and the Society for Human Resource Management. If you plan on receiving continuing education for this program or a general certificate, please proceed with the following steps. First, you must log in individually. Participants who listen in on someone else's line will not receive credit. Second, you must complete and submit the evaluation and post-test, as well as receive a passing grade on the post-test. Uh, you will receive an email with all of this information following today's session. That email will be sent by 5 p.m. Eastern time tomorrow, Thursday, and certificates will be emailed within four to six weeks. Also, please note that the planners and presenters for this program have not disclosed any pertinent financial relationships or conflicts of interest, and no commercial support was provided with this program. Thanks to direct support from Genentech, HSN, and QVC, Cancer and Careers is able to offer the seventh year of the Balancing Work in Cancer webinar series. The program was created to provide patients and survivors, as well as their care teams and employers with concise, targeted information about the work-related issues that arise after a cancer diagnosis. Additionally, we'd like to recognize Cancer and Careers year-round sponsors who support all of our core programs and allow us to continue providing all resources and services free of charge. <clears throat> We often hear from cancer survivors uh, going through a cancer diagnosis and treatment have brought up different ideas and ignited a new passion in them. Many state they're ready for a change at work. For some, it's that they're more aware of the value of their time and what's meaningful to them, especially when it comes to work. And as we start talking about meaningful work, it's important to remember that the word meaning suggests that something is significant. And what might be significant for one person may be different for another. So many people assume meaningful work means getting a job with a charity, but there's actually many other ways to find meaning in a job. This and so much more will be discussed in today's webinar. So I wanna take this time to jump in um, to take us through this topic. I'm thrilled to introduce Julie Jansen. Julie's a speaker, trainer, coach, and author who's helped thousands of professionals find success and satisfaction at work, as well as find work that's gratifying. Most important to us, Julie is one of the original coaches at CAC, helping patients and survivors with their individual employment challenges. Following Julie's presentation, there will be time for me to ask questions, um, but for now, I'm gonna hand it over to Julie to get things started. Thanks, Nicole, I appreciate it. So, quite frequently at Cancer and Careers, we hear people say that after having cancer, they no longer feel that the work they've been doing aligns with what's important to them from a values or a lifestyle standpoint. However, it can be really difficult to either decide what you might want to do work-wise, or if you do, how to actually go about changing careers. And for years and, and moving forward, engaging in a single career or a single lifelong profession is no longer the way we work or will continue to work in the future. Um, the US Department of Labor comes out with stats every uh, year or so, and they estimate, they keep estimating that Americans in particular will have more and more and more jobs, um, holding jobs now on an average of about two years, and um, probably, you know, having upwards of 10 different types of quote unquote careers. So this means that changing careers is not only extremely acceptable, it's expected more than one job with half holding both a full-time and a part-time position in what is known nowadays as a side hustle. And there's the pandemic, which has forced many people to reinvent themselves as well as caused even more people to decide that they wanna be as gratified as they can in their work. And I will say, hands down in 20 years of being in, in this business as a career coach, I have never ever seen so many people focused on changing or shifting their functional areas and industries. So, <clears throat> trying to move, okay. So as adults, we tend to believe that we know the right and the wrong ways to do things. We're very mired in our habits. 
Um, and it becomes hard to change. Um, and so in addition to giving you some practical tips in a few moments, what I'd like to do is make you a little bit more aware of yourself and how others may perceive you. Um, as you probably know, your attitude truly influences everything you do and say. So if you're nervous or you're angry or you're apathetic, this shows, even if you think it doesn't. And these are all emotions that people don't find appealing, yet easily affect the way you will present yourself. The world, of course, is not fair, and unresolved feelings about your circumstances will jeopardize your uh, quest for career change. So flexibility is a real um, crucial key to success. It's just not the right approach to put up too many parameters that would preclude you other than parameters that involve protecting your health, which is very important for many of you. So um, when I talk to recruiters, they say, you know, we obviously want people who have experience or who have transferable skills, but really what makes candidates stand out is um, they're a positive attitude and someone who's really flexible. Think of ways to have energy and enthusiasm. People are drawn to others who are energetic and enthusiastic. So just kind of think about how you can stand out in that regard. Even if you have more of a chill personality, it's just good to ratchet up that energy. And you know that nobody, nobody owes you anything, but really no one's out to get you necessarily intentionally either. So you can create your own destiny, especially today with all the choices that are out there in the workplace. Definitely explore alternatives even if you're focused on something different until you know an option isn't for you. So for example, if you really would prefer a full-time job, be open to a contract, freelance or part-time position. Clearly employers are hiring more contract and part-time employees than they have in years. Industries that have been hiring and expanding in 2021 are manufacturing, food, consumer products, logistics and distribution, pharma, biotech, technology, data mining, online education and learning, sports betting, and gaming. And, and just for another laundry list, according to recent research by LinkedIn, CareerFitter, and several other resources, the in-demand jobs for hiring in 2021, and this is just to kind of trigger some thoughts for you about changing careers, are the following an artificial intelligence practitioner, a data, data analyst have always um, been around, but they're, they're in every industry now, digital and video marketers, digital content creators, cybersecurity specialists, computer programmers, Java developers, statisticians, that's a tongue twister, and mathematicians, UX designers, that's a user experience, blockchain developers is becoming bigger, workplace diversity experts, genetic counseling, mental health specialists, nurse practitioners, in-home caregivers, what we have, what's now called the frontline commerce worker, that would be a delivery driver, supply chain associate, package handler, or personal shopper, a wind turbine technician, solar installers, forest fire inspectors and prevention specialists, and my favorite, a bicycle repair specialist, as more and more people are conscious of the environment and not wanting to use a car. Regardless of the type of job, whether it's one of these that I've listed or something a little bit more traditional, your ability to utilize technology is imperative. It's not acceptable to use age or a lack of interest as an excuse. And also consider what's called a returnship. Um, returnships are primarily offered by larger companies such as Wells Fargo, Santander, Audible, Grubhub, Goldman Sachs, um, Amazon. But what an intern, a returnship is essentially is a program intentionally um, geared for experienced workers who have been out of work for two years or more and have at least five years of experience. And there's a complete list of uh, who offers that kind of returnship program on irelaunch.com. There are also companies who hire older interns on a more informal basis. And if you really think you want an internship and something that you don't know enough about, just ask, and even if you might do it for free for a little bit, it's a great way to get some real experience. Your attitude about your age, your race, your religion, your gender will certainly influence the attitudes of others. And it's a reality that age discrimination, chauvinism, and prejudice exist. While companies are really focused on changing this now, 
it's still here, just don't dwell on it. And your, your career change will always, always take more time and more energy than you expect. Timing is everything, you'll get impatient, try to be reasonable in your efforts at time management and learn to deal with the psychological impact of time passing. And finally, there is no question whatsoever that most companies are hiring now. Most interviewing is still virtual, but companies are still involving employees in the interviewing process. They're asking job candidates to make presentations or doing psychological and personality testing, background checks, drug checks, you name it. So some of the things that you want to ask yourself if you're thinking about changing careers, and, and there are many reasons for making a career change. Your employer's circumstances may have changed because they reorged, you were laid off, or more likely you and your goals may have changed. That's your focus, your desires, your interests, whether it's because of your cancer experience or because of the pandemic, or sadly a combination of two of those. Um, it may cause you to strongly consider making a career change. So no matter what the circumstances are um, that cause you to rethink your career options, be reassured in knowing that it is natural to think about starting over, getting a new job in your industry with a different employer or in an entirely new one. And I would urge you to get advice from trusted colleagues or outside career professionals before making that decision to follow your dreams. Um, so clients that I've worked with have found the following questions to be useful in helping them make that determination to seek alternative work. Obviously, what are your financial needs? Um, shocking at how many people don't actually know how much money they spend and how much money they need other than the basic expenses like a mortgage or rent. What's your required timeline, um, which is often driven by the first question about your finances? Who depends on your income and what are alternative sources of income besides your salary? Um, I mentioned a side hustle earlier. It's really, as a career coach, I highly recommend that you think about lots of different ways that you can earn money, even if you're not changing careers. Will your chosen new career path require you to get a certification, perhaps another degree or some sort of training? Other questions. Can you afford training or the time off that it, that it may require? Um, do you have the stamina given your physical and mental um, situation? If you're suffering from chemo brain, um, do you have the stamina to complete the training that you need to do? Can you afford to take an entry level job or as I mentioned earlier, an internship in your new industry? Are companies actually hiring in your chosen new career? You know, when I mentioned a, a solar installer, uh, there probably are not thousands of jobs for a solar installer. So you might wanna just be careful about doing your market research and finding out how many jobs there are and whatever it is you're looking at. And are your dreams of a new career realistic given your specific circumstances? So, I wrote this book quite a while ago. It's in the third edition. I did pitch my publisher to, to write another edition last year during the pandemic. And they said it was um, still ideal for today, which was you know good and bad news because I kind of wanted to do another edition. But, but the book is focused on um, a very simple process for changing careers. It's three steps. I'm not saying it's simple to do, but it's simple to explain. And that's what I'm going to do in our next moments together. The first is self-assessment. Always start with self-exploration, getting to know who you are. Um, you know, again, you might need, you're certainly going to take some tests and assessments. You might need advice and counseling from someone like a career coach like me. You might go back to your university or college and go to their career services. Um, but whatever you do, it's crucial for you to first take an inventory of what's your personality like? You know, take the MBTI, the Myers-Briggs. Um, what are the skills you wanna use? What are your interests? What are some of your accomplishments that got you excited and energized? And looking back over your career and highlighting the things that you enjoyed and are most proud of is a big part of the self-assessment process. Um, when I have people fill out a questionnaire for career coaching or writing a resume, most people say to me, I've never done this before. I've never thought about myself and who I am and what I want, which I find really fascinating. 
and it's always a very useful process for them. So when you write everything down, um, you look for patterns in this inventory of yourself to hone in on your areas of keenest interests or your abilities. And while this thorough sort of self-analysis may seem tedious and may seem to delay the process, it's essential not only in determining your career change path, but also for writing a resume, cover letters, and interviewing. Um, so therefore, you know, once you kind of know more about yourself and you're able to speak to it in different formats, it will all, it will build your confidence, and it'll be likely that you'll feel like you have something to offer. You're able to articulate this to new employers or clients if you start your own business, even if you don't have experience with whatever it is. So. Um, and then identifying opportunities and obstacles is the second piece, which we'll talk about a little bit later, and then always the boring, but create an action plan. So let's dig into the self-assessment piece. Um, when you are first thinking about yourself, for me, foundationally, I like to have people review their values. Um, I'm going to be coaching someone after this webinar. And... I had her do the values assessment. And what you're doing with values is you're, you're really looking at what motivates you, what fulfills you, what are the top five to 10 most important standards or qualities that you deem as inherently valuable to you and your well being. And your values, I mean, in, in the book that I wrote, there's 100 values. You certainly don't uh, prescribe to all of those, but they can range from autonomy and building something to helping others, to learning, to self-expression, physical activity, family happiness, balance or blending, achievement, teamwork, you name it. But those are foundational because if you don't change careers into something that uh, aligns with your values, it will not work. It just won't eventually. Your attitudes is something that I sort of invented, I didn't invent the word attitudes, but these are the, these are the categories. Um, your self-confidence, you know, I'll allude to confidence a lot in this webinar because it's, you really need confidence to plunge into exploring something new, to be able to talk to people about who you are and what you have to offer, and just to feel good about yourself and present your best self. And so it goes without saying that, um, you know, your state of mind directly impacts your behavior. And if you don't have self-confidence, and it's really key that you work on developing that and improving that. Self-knowledge is exactly what we're talking about right now. Know who you are. Um, one of the biggest reasons that I am asked by companies to coach people is that their level of self-knowledge and self-awareness is very low, no matter if it's a very experienced person with a lot of years doing what they've been doing, um, somehow people just don't know themselves. And that's not everybody. It, it's a larger percentage than you would think. Managing relationships is everything. You cannot do any of the things that we're talking about in this webinar without having relationships with people. And people mistakenly think, you know, when you think of networking, they think of relationships as being who I know. It's not who you know. It's who knows you. And who, you know, I, I reached out to two people to help, ask them to help um, a very, uh, someone entry level who wants to look at broadcast journalism. Immediately, those two people got right back to me. I was shocked because they're very busy. And I, and I was really delighted that I've been able to leverage my network to help my clients because I've, I've worked very hard at maintaining relationships. And that's everything. Um, motivation. It's hard to be motivated when you don't know what you're looking for, what you want to do, but you do need to be motivated about um, the kind of hard work that you have to do to figure out how to be successful at this process of career change and think of ways to motivate yourself, um, whether it's just doing something you enjoy or making sure you call you know, your fan club every other day or, you know, making sure you sleep well and, you know, whatever it is, stry, stay motivated. Nobody has the same level of motivation every minute, every hour, every day, naturally. Um, and especially if you're still going through treatment or you, your uh, cancer experience is more recent, you know, you have to kind of um, time yourself. 
Goal orientation, set little goals, not big goals, just little goals. Your goal is not ever going to be, I want to change careers. It's going to be, I want to identify two things that are interesting to me that I can research until I decide they're not interesting to me any longer. And then finally, just having a professional commitment. And what I mean by that is learn everything you can about whatever it is that you end up looking at. Read about it, um, watch people who do it, talk to people who do it. That's all really significant in helping you um, figure out what you wanna do next. Everybody has a specific personality. Um, Nicole has a, a, a toddler and she already knows exactly what her daughter's personality is. You know, you know, by the time your child or you as a person are a year old, you know what your personality is. Um, you're either, and you can change certain aspects of your personality, or at least you can pretend to, but inherently most of it is who you are. So are you introverted or outgoing? Um, are you emotion, more emotional? Or are you reliant more on facts? Do you prefer more structure than spontaneity? Um, are you more assertive or more acquiescent? And, and these are and these are just my my terms. But I mentioned the MBTI, the Myers Briggs. That's the most validated personality type test, and I highly recommend you take it. There's 16 different types, and there's specific kinds of work that actually align with your personality. Um, there's a book called Do What You Are great book written by someone I know named Paul Teeger. And once you know your MBTI type, which is four letters, you can go to that book and go to the chapter for your four letter type. And it will be very clear about the types of jobs and the type of work that would be gratifying to you. And then still continuing on self-assessment, interests. So um, it's not necessary to feel passionate about your work or business but it certainly is important to be pretty interested in it. And if not, or if you're doing something that hasn't turned out to be as interesting as you thought it would be, it's really important to kind of see what rings your chime. So, so what I did is I sort of broke interest down into um, four categories and people tend to be drawn more to some of these than others. So there's people. So I'm a people person because of what I do for a living. So I'm much more energized by working with people more often, where some people aren't. They'd rather work with data, um, like be a data analyst or be a coder. Um, some people are more interested in ideas um, and some people objects. So that would be someone who likes to use their hands or build things. And we all are drawn to a few of these and we might be drawn to all of them but definitely one of the four or two of the four are going to be more prominent as far as what you're interested in. And so you wanna kind of remember that when you're looking at work and how you would spend the larger portion of your time. And then uh, finally, in the self-assessment piece, your favorite skills, I call them. So favorite skills are skills that you still wanna keep using. We all have skills, um, you know, by the time you're 35 years old, you already have, 40, 50 skills, not that most people can list them, but it doesn't mean you need to use them just because it's a skill. I mean, I've basically figured out how to develop an Excel a spreadsheet, if I can talk, but um, I have no interest in, in doing Excel spreadsheets all day where a lot of people, that's a lion's share of their work. So be clear about what skills you want to use and also be clear about skills that have always interested you, but they're what I call untested. You just haven't had an opportunity to use or to develop those skills. And that may be something that you want to incorporate in whatever it is you're, you're looking at next. So what I did is I identified um, six different types of work situations. And just briefly, they're here. When I, I initially interviewed about 150 people when I was given this opportunity to, to write this book, and I when I did the third edition, I went back to most of the same people and interviewed some new people. And they still, it still came out that these were the kind of the six situations that I gave these little catchy names to. Um, and while they seem a little bit negative in nature, like something's missing, um, I found that you know, like it or not, that's what resonates for people. And so I'm gonna 
Um, I don't even think I need to explain them briefly, but what I'm going to do is jump in, but just quickly there, where's the meaning? Been there, done that, but still need to earn. Bruised and gun shy, bored and plateaued, yearning to be on your own and one toe in the retirement pool. So let's go into um, the first one. Where's the meaning? So in my survey, more individuals ranked this category as his, her number one reason for dissatisfaction. While doing research, I learned that meaning signifies really different things for everyone. So what I did is I actually identified 10 types of meaning and I broke them down and um, this is what they are. So the first is rewards and challenges. Well, people think of money. Most people are not really driven just by money. They wanna be paid fairly, but, um, and, and unfortunately a lot of people think that um, if you're finding something that's meaningful, it means that you're going to have to take a, take a decrease in earning, which might be true initially, and it might not be true actually. So rewards and challenges are new opportunities, could be money, could be benefits, it could be recognition. Um, an intriguing, attractive, or energizing field or industry. Some people, you know, when you look at um, broad, the guy that I mentioned before, my client, he's interested in broadcast journalism, and that's an interesting industry to him. He hasn't had any experience in it. He may learn that there's a lot of downside to that particular industry, but people tend to be drawn, you know, to sort of the sports and the arts and things like that. Um, and some people are just more interested functionally in what they do and they don't really care what industry they're going to be in. Um, expressing your ideals and your values is probably, I would say, almost the number one type of meaning that people are looking for now. They wanna be them. They wanna be individual. They wanna have a lifestyle. Well, it's not kind of lifestyle. It's more like what they believe in. They want to be able to, to live that. Uh, contributing, making a difference. That's, I know that's a big one for me. Giving back, sharing, helping, changing or improving something. Um, those things are all uh, very important to certain people. Solving problems or answering complex questions. Uh, there's different levels of problems, of course, and we all solve problems all day, but some of us focus on a little bit more than others. I don't solve, a, I, other than solving people's problems or helping them solve their own problems, I don't really solve problems that much. Changing your lifestyle, I kind of alluded to that earlier. Um, that's, uh, the, you know, they're calling it the great resignation era right now. Um, with people moving, uh, moving out of cities, moving into uh, the country, moving to just change their lifestyle. It's probably one of the biggest, biggest mo motivators that people have right now after, you know, we're still in the pandemic, of course. Feeling passionate about something. I'm, I don't think it's realistic to feel passionate uh, rather, as I intro this, be interested. I think that's important. But some people do need to feel passionate. Um, I had a client once who, her name was Liz, and she all she cared about was bringing water to the world, and especially in other countries. And it was just water, water, water for her. Supporting a cause. Nicole mentioned that when she introed this webinar. Um, contributing time, resources, or expertise. Um, sometimes nonprofits or cause-related charities can be extremely dysfunctional because I was talking to someone at a birthday party I went to in uh, Chinatown, New York on Sunday. And um, it was he was talking about the fact that he's shocked by the nonprofit world and how limited resources are and how people don't have any as much training, you know, and that was just his his experience. And that's not true across the board, of course. So just do your research if you're really looking in that direction. Innovating, it's introducing, producing, imagining, new and different. Uh, and we're a society that loves new and different. And then finally, learning, gaining knowledge, understanding, expertise. It gets a little bit boring and monotonous to be doing the same thing and not learning. And I'll, I'll have a number of clients who'll say, I'm just not learning anymore. I've done it, done it, done it. So, um, there are many ways to pursue meaning. I would suggest that you look at this list and you really think of yourself and which of the 10, maybe there's two, maybe there's four that are the most important to you. 
Okay, so then there's been there, done that, but still need to earn. So these are people who have large fixed expenses like college loans, um, maintenance payments, or alimony. Um, they need, the biggest obstacle here is that they don't have a plan. So it doesn't mean if you're a been there, done that, but still need to earn person, you're not gonna be able to probably jump in six months to whatever it is that you'd like to do next. But you do wanna plan it and you do wanna take advantage of the fact that you're still earning at whatever level you are. And um, you know, look at, look at, review your self-assessment results. What's your financial situation? Do you have a budget? Have you met with financial advisors? Can you reconfigure your job or your business? And what other elements of your future career can you actually plan so that when you are ready to go through the process, you've done a lot of your homework and not to say that it won't be tweaking depending on the time frame, but you'll feel a lot more easily equipped to start moving forward. Bruised and gun shy. Eh, it's sad, but there's so many people who have been victimized. Um, it's a difficult, changing, just challenging workplace. It really is. And so whatever has happened to you, and it's happened to all of us, whether being laid off, having, a, having I have a couple people I'm coaching who just have very difficult managers, um, being caught in corporate politics, not fitting into a culture, whatever it is, the clear obstacle in this category or situation is lowered self-esteem and confidence. So here I am bringing up confidence again. So ways to improve your self-esteem and your confidence. And those are two different things, but um, do things that you're already good at. Set achievable goals, surround yourself with people who care about you. Um, learn new things because that's always a good way to jumpstart yourself into um, you know, building your confidence and always trust your gut. Most people that have gut that is on the money and when they didn't listen to it and they lined up the facts instead, they wish that they had. And always have a contingency plan and, and take care of, you know, mental health, thank goodness, is, is out there now much more than it ever has been. And mental health is so crucial. And of course, your physical health, um, for those of you who are well aware of that, is just as important. Bored and plateaued. Everybody at some point in their career or their work or a job hits this. Everybody does. And there's nothing wrong with it. It is very, I know I shouldn't use the word normal, but it is very normal. And it just means that you're looking to make a change that you've done it. Um, you're kind of a been there, done that, but bored. And, and I was talking to someone today who's choosing a coach and she works at a big pharma company and she's been there 20 years and she's about to turn 50. And she was saying, I don't, I've loved what I've done, but I don't know. I'm starting to wonder if this is what I should be doing. She has young children still. And she's like, I need help with that. Um, because maybe it's not, maybe it is, maybe it isn't. So the biggest obstacle here may be just making a decision that you need to do something to not be bored because it isn't healthy to be bored, not for long anyway. So look at your current and your past situation, assess, remind yourself, what does give you enjoyment and fulfillment? I mean, some people decide, oh, you know what? I've been managing teams. I don't wanna manage people anymore. I just want to be a, a single contributor and do the, you know, the content of what I like doing and not deal with managing people. Um, is there a way that you can revitalize your situation by trying something new, volunteering for something? Um, could you, should you consider leaving your job, but maybe staying in your industry and going somewhere else? Maybe you'll be less bored for a while, but maybe you will, you will be bored again. So you need to really assess that carefully. And can you just decide, well, I'm a little bit bored in my work, but I'm comfortable. So maybe I need to, you know, sort of energize my outside life a little bit. Yearning to be on your own. It's scary to 
think about doing your own business. And that's why I always recommend to people, if you don't have that great idea and you're not financed really well, maybe you should do the side hustle, freelancing, the side gig, a little LLC, doing business as, and dabble in something. Um, but what there's so many options to be on your own. And so just thinking through what's the most appealing, what's the best fit for your needs? Is it being a contract employee, freelancer? Is it purchasing? You know, believe it or not, franchises are still very popular. Um, the, the note about franchises, food franchises are the most popular still, but they're also the highest investment and the highest rate of failure. Service businesses, as far as franchises, are definitely the most successful, such as cleaning, beauty, signage, pet grooming, tutoring, those kinds of things. Um, but the most the most common barriers, and I know this having been in my own business many years, are you have to constantly be selling and marketing. And some people get into something because they like it or they're good at it, but they've never sold or they've never marketed or they they don't they find it sort of repugnant. And you do have to do that. You do have to make people aware and you can't just do it on social media. That doesn't work. So maintaining cash flow, um, lack of a support system or resources. I mean, I know people in their own business whose families don't support them, whose families, you know, spouses keep asking them to go get a job and um, the ability to blend. I mean, I've, I've kind of figured that out, but it took me years to figure out how to blend running my own business and, and my life. And it's very difficult to do that on a consistent basis, but very rewarding, I might say. So, and then the, the final is one toe in the retirement pool. So with COVID, uh, there's more people. I, I have a friend who's retiring at 50. She worked at a big company. She's got, you know, she's set up financially. She's like, I don't want to work anymore. I'm tired of this. You know, and I'm seeing more and more people who are younger, quote unquote, retiring. It doesn't mean they're going to sit in a rocking chair <laughs> and knit Afghans. It just means, or, you know, it just, whatever, blankets. It just means that they might want to do something different. Um, but just like anything else that we've talked about today, you have to do some planning. And of course, all, there's finances. Where do you want to live? There's all sorts of lists out there and, and resources and research for great places to live. Um, what kind of work do you wanna do in retirement? I mean, some people are not happy just volunteering. I know I wouldn't be if I were to retire. It just does not appeal to me at all. So um, everybody's different. And um, really only about 15% of people who decide to retire don't work at all. Everybody else does something of some sort. Okay, so as you might recall, the next step um, would be to identify opportunities and roadblocks. And so I think, you know, I'm, I'm an optimist, I'm a career coach. So I think opportunities are limitless. I, you just need to talk to people and do research and identify trends. And uh, my favorite is think about problems that need solving. There's so many little problems that need solving, you know, so it could be just inventing a, a cool little product. Like I just bought um, a uh, case for my vaccine, for my vaccination card. And I was like, oh, this is so, and there's so many on Etsy. And I bought this nice, pretty yellow one. And um, I just said, you know, I just, and I just have, you know, like the whole mask thing. I just have to give so many people credit for thinking about um, an, an issue or a problem or a need and being able to come up with something. So that's a good way to think about like, what would you want to do next? And then people kind of always think, oh, I'm too old. Um, yeah, you know, everybody's too old for something. Um, but there's a lot of industries and a lot of companies and a lot of people that, that don't care. And, and unfortunately, age is one of the few categories that is not recognized when it comes to discrimination. Although there is age discrimination law, but it's just not thought of as um, a big area of discrimination in our country. And hopefully that will be changing as we move along. People worry about money. I mentioned that earlier about where's the meaning that people automatically think, oh, if I do something I find meaningful, I won't make as much money. Um, there's lots of different ways to make money. Um, time, I don't, I just don't have enough time um, to figure this out. I, it could take me a few years. They might worry that 
you know, they don't have industry experience or that they need additional education and they don't want to pay for it or take the time to do it. And then finally, an action plan, a thoughtful written action plan, simple, brief, is what brings a dream to life. Finally, it's just write it down, use bullet points, maybe use this, this smart formula, you know, specific, measurable, actionable, realistic timeline. When I mentioned goals earlier, think of little pieces of a plan. This does not have to be an intricate um, two-year plan. Keep it really flexible, write it down, um, revisit it often. Don't, don't create a plan and then put it in a, you know, a Word document in a file in your computer and forget about it. Um, run it by people. And if you do these three things, assess yourself, um, what kind of situation are you in? Why, do you, why are you thinking about changing careers? Who are you? What's important to you? What are opportunities and obstacles for you? And creating a simple plan, I absolutely almost guarantee that you will be successful at changing careers. Thank you. And I'm going to turn it over to Nicole. Great. Well, thank you so much, Julie. Um, I hope this presentation gave you all some really good things to think about and some self-assessment guidance as you consider changing careers or whatever it is that brought you here today. Um, before we move on to the q and I do want to point out just uh, a number of our resources. We have our resume review, which was mentioned. Um, we also have an Ask a Career Coach message board, our publications, which includes our job search toolkit, and of course, uh, our many informational articles on our website. Technical difficulty. Um, and I just want to point out some of our upcoming uh, events. Um, so we have a number of uh, remaining webinars throughout the year. We do them monthly. Um, so our next one will be in September, covering balance and organ cancer, which is a pretty umbrella uh, topic. Um, and then we also have our virtual West Coast Conference, which is taking place uh, October 16th. Uh, registration is now open. It is free. It's a full day event and it will be great. Um, I do also want to make an announcement that's not on here, but our financial assistance grants applications open today. So if you are interested in checking that out to see if you're eligible, um, please definitely take a look. Um, so I'm just going to leave up our CEO requirements while we move on to the Q&A portion of this session. Um, so if anybody has any questions, please uh, put them in the Q&A box. Uh, we're happy to address any of those while, uh, while we have Julie available with us today. One question um, from Rebecca. Um, can you justify being in the same position for a long time anymore due to family obligations? Um, so I'm gonna make sure I understand the question. Can you justify being in the same position? In other words, would that be, I'm not, I don't understand the question. I think what they're asking is if there's any, um, if it would look bad uh, sticking around uh, in the same oh, position. no, not at all. I mean, I don't, I, I don't, maybe someone might in an interview say, well, why have you been there so long? And you do mm -hmm. want to be prepared for any question that you feel like it would be a stumper. Uh, but you, it's just, uh, well, I've had the opportunity to, you know, be in, a, work in a lot of different roles and I've had so many achievements and I love the culture and, you know, whatever your reasons are, it's absolutely fine. Just because it's not a trend for people to stay a long time doesn't mean it's right, a bad right. thing. <laughs> Which is funny because there's always the concern that you're not somewhere. Yeah, long exactly. Um, this question comes from Christina. Uh, how might you explain why you haven't advanced in your career? I have been an associate recruiter for many years because I've been on disability and don't know if it's a bad idea to say because I've had cancer. Um, I can address that one. First, and then maybe yeah, to the, the sure. that one. Um, Christina, obviously, um, we do discuss disclosure a lot in a lot of our uh, webinars and our articles. Um, it is a personal decision 
Um, but we do recommend kind of thinking about why exactly you would be sharing, how important it is to be sharing this kind of information with them. Um, you know, if there is an alternative explanation for why you've been in that specific position for a while, that's something to consider. I don't think that you need to necessarily say, oh, well, it's because I'm on disability and period, end of story. Um, there are some creative spins you could take on it. Um, and I'm, I'd be happy to kind of spitball some of those with you as well. Um, in terms of how it looks and what you might say in terms of why you haven't advanced in your career, I'll probably hand it over to Julie in terms of language to use um, to explain that. Sure, thanks, Nicole. So I think it's, if you're an interviewing for a higher level position somewhere else and someone says, well, I see you haven't been promoted at your company. And that would be, I could see that being a natural question that someone would ask. Um, again, you're going to have a very practical response, something like, yes, that's true. It's very, there's, there's a, it's very plateaued um, in our organization. And I really love working for the company and enjoy the people and I have a great boss. And so it, those things were more important to me than um, getting a different title. Mm -hmm. And now I've realized that I'm, I'm ready for that, you know, and that's why I'm here talking to you. So that kind of an answer is 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 great. Would it be um, a little bit of an echo? Would it be a good idea to maybe say something along the lines of you know there wasn't a lot of opportunity for growth at me at this place, and that's why? Or do you feel? And that's like what I meant when I said it's plateaued here. Okay. It's just been very plateaued in our way. You, you you probably said that's. I like the way you said it better. There just hasn't been opportunity for growth because it's a you know there's it's there's a word for it that like there's just not a huge number of employees and there's not a lot of levels. Um, so I just opted to have a great boss and have a great culture and you know say something positive. So you're like kind of being positive about it. And now I've realized and in, in, in thinking about it, it's time for me to look for something different. Right. right. Next level. Yeah. Ambitions and whatnot. Um, Danielle asked if there's a website that you recommend that has all the tests that you had recommended to take. So they come from my book. <laughs> so they're, and the book is, I don't know what I want, but I know it's not this, a step-by-step -step guide to finding gratifying work. It's a mouthful. <laughs> <laughs> um, there's another question from John. Um, if I don't know many people in my desired field, who do you ask for advice in the field and who should I be comfortable asking for their time? So that's what LinkedIn is great for, is do just do some research on, like identify some companies that are in the industry. I don't know if you're, it's an industry you're interested in or a type of job, but whichever it is, find some people and then send them a customized invitation and say, would you mind if, would you have time to, um, spend a little bit of time with me. Like I have a client who's interested in the company Headspace mm -hmm. and she works in an agency right now. And so she, I found someone, for, she's in project management. So I found someone for her on LinkedIn that I'm not connected to, but I found the person as head of that. And I just coached her on what to write. And she sent him a little email to just say, would you mind spending some time talking to me because I'm really interested in your company? And that's that, and most and either they're going to respond or they're not. And if they don't, then you go on to the next person. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I and just want to quickly plug our um, networking webinar that we held um, earlier in June, as well as our building a LinkedIn profile webinar. Both of these can be really helpful um, in terms of just kind of getting more comfortable around the idea of networking, how to use LinkedIn a little bit more effectively. And uh, you know, kind of removing some of that anxiety that surrounds that part of looking for work and connecting with other people. Um, Dean asked, how can I go about finding employers in my area now that they don't mail you the yellow pages? Um, well, I, that would be online research. Yeah, so you can Google anything. Mm -hmm. So employers, you know, an industry by industry function. Um, and also it, you may not be on LinkedIn, but LinkedIn is an, another great resource. So anybody who ever lists a company that they work for on LinkedIn in their profile, that LinkedIn automatically creates 
a company profile for that company. So that's a great place to find companies. Okay. Um, I do see a number of questions uh, regarding sharing your diagnosis. So I will take that. Okay. Um, uh, someone is asking about changing a career based on your diagnosis as in wanting to go into the medical industry. Um, mm -hmm. This is something that we really hear about frequently, we um, specifically about going into the cancer space, going into nonprofits, going into healthcare organizations. Um, I actually just wrote a blog about this earlier this week um, in that a lot of people tend to think that sharing their diagnosis will be seen as a positive when you are applying to jobs within that space. And while the perspective that it brings certainly is a benefit, um, it's important to keep in mind that employers legally aren't really allowed to ask you further questions about your diagnosis. And so the, the conversation can sort of be stunted in a way because you're not able to kind of have an in-depth conversation because it's not as uh, dynamic of an exchange because they're not able to ask you the same questions. So, you know, you can talk about a diagnosis impacting your life. You can talk about feeling passionately about cancer in general um, without necessarily talking about your own diagnosis. Um, you know, we're currently hiring at Cancer and Careers and you know, some people might feel like, well, you know, I had cancer, so I'd be the perfect candidate. And while, <laughs> you know, that perspective is certainly valuable, um, it's important to sell your skills uh, as a professional as well. Um, so talking about your organization. So let's say, you know, you were juggling a lot of doctor's appointments when you were, when you were uh, sick and getting treated. Talk about how you're able to time manage and organize and and schedule and things like that and how they might apply to the job and not necessarily just thinking you're gonna go in there and talk about your diagnosis as the number one reason why they should hire you. Um, so I tend to encourage people to play it close to the vest and not necessarily share too much information uh, right off the bat. If you feel uh, you've gotten to a place in an interviewing stage where it would be appropriate, then that's something that you can kind of evaluate and assess then. But um, you know, lead with your expertise and your skills and your experience in whatever the industry is that you're applying for. Um, and then think of this as maybe an added, an added uh, bonus later on that you might want to share with them. Um, but don't lead with that is really. Uh, yeah. I don't know if you have anything else you'd want to add to that, Julie. I thought that was awesome. I mean, it's exactly right. It's, um, and we all, no matter what the situation is, we, we often think that we, because it's something, they're going to think it's just as significant or important. And it's really more about, like Nicole said, about understanding what the organization is looking for, you know, what's important to them, what kind of person do they think will succeed, and focusing more on them and less on yourself right. until you have to sell yourself. Yeah. And it's important to also remember that you don't know the context of what people are hearing. So Maybe the interviewer has lost someone um, to cancer, so they really don't believe that someone with cancer can work, even though obviously that's you know false. Uh, there are still going to be biases, and that's why it's important to kind of protect ourselves in uh, in the interview process and the job search process. Yeah. Um, I think that there is a, another question. Um, I, I think. Oh, I, I saw, go ahead, Nicole, sorry. Um, I um, I've been in a career change for a while. Uh, I went back to an old career of retail sales, but I plateaued there. I was in technology and I know that I don't want to return there. What's the next step for me? Yeah, so it's go through the process that I outlined in this webinar because I can't, it's hard for me to answer that question without knowing you and knowing what, what your skills are and um, what interests you, you know? So it sounds like you need to kind of revisit who you are and what you want um, and then go forward from there uh, rather than focusing on industries or whatever, you know, because there's so, yeah, there's 70,000 different jobs. There's so many different types of jobs. There's so many different industries. I mean, that whole big laundry list of jobs that I listed that were just kind of more entertaining. Mm -hmm. A lot of them are new, you know, that, there are there there are jobs that have existed forever, but now they're hot and and significant. So just kind of go back and start over with who you are and take some assessments. Absolutely. Do you feel like the the fact that there are so many jobs available right now um, that 
employers are more open to hiring people who don't have that same experience uh, that they had once looked for. It for Absolutely. It's the, one of the best things that I've seen come out of the pandemic, mm -hmm. on, you know, from a work standpoint, is that yeah. employers, they don't like it, but they're, they're having to be incredibly more flexible mm -hmm. on so many levels. And I'm just so overjoyed to see that. Not every company, but, and they're, and they're learning the hard way. Companies. So in some ways, it seems like now employees have the opportunity to be much pickier than they had in the past. Um, and, and, and yeah, not be choosier, but also be clearer about their needs and wants. You know, not just be choosy about the opportunity, but what do they need and want and how communicating that to companies and having companies flex and say, okay, we have ne never done that before, but we will. Right. right. Especially because we know a lot of these things are now possible that in the past yes. there had been the indication that they were not a possibility. So um, we have one more question uh, from Susan. Uh, how do you work through exhaustion from your current job coupled with your past cancer treatment and getting closer to retirement age? I know I want to move on, but I'm feeling really exhausted. Well, I, your, your physical and mental health is the most important. And so if you're just feeling too exhausted, then I would suggest you just, you know, it's a lot that you're dealing with and just give yourself a break. Mm -hmm. And when, when you, when you know, you'll know when you feel more ready. And even when you do feel ready, it's really, like I said, your big, your big goal is I need to change careers. It's what's the next thing I should do to move me closer to knowing what I want to do. That's it. What, what information do I need? You know, and I like once I went to a therapist um, a couple of years ago and she, and I'm, I'm so decisive and like, I have to do this, I have to do this. And she said to me, Julie, don't, you don't need to make a decision until you have the information that you need to make a decision. Mm -hmm. And I was like, oh yeah, <laughs> that makes sense. You know, I, you don't need to do it just to do it, do it when it feels right and ready. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. I think, you know, it's, as much as we encourage people to continue working when they feel up for it, the keywords are feeling up for it. And so yes. there's no shame in needing to take some time to yourself to recuperate. Um, I think a lot of uh, cancer patients and survivors that I speak with tend to put a lot of pressure on themselves to meet some you know, imaginary standard that they themselves have set. Yes. Um, and that internal pressure can just make you more exhausted and make the whole process a lot more challenging. So, um, you know, beyond getting a job, keeping a job, returning to work, it's really just the most important to take care of yourself and to read the signs and to know what's healthy for you and what's not yeah. um, mentally and physically. So sometimes that might mean taking some time off or getting a new job that might be a little less demanding. It's um, okay to coast. And, you know, Nicole's right. And I think I, you know, I harped on confidence a lot in this webinar and when you're exhausted, you're not feeling confident and like you should be, you're not, they're aligned. And so it's, you've got to have confidence for this process, even if it's just regular job search, you, you have to have it. Absolutely, I mean, confidence is kind of kind of key in a lot of these things. And that's what uh, part of Cancer and Care's mission is, is to empower people because at the end of the day, you're gonna yeah. be your best advocate. You're gonna be the best person to, to help you forward. Um, before we end, or we're, we're almost done, I just wanted to just circle back on the financial grants that I had mentioned earlier. Um, you know, they are for some emergency assistance, such as bills and rent and things like that, but uh, they are also available for people who are looking to take certain certification classes or do continuing education. Um, we've also done career coaching sessions. So uh, if you are interested in that, it can be a really great program to kind of um, supplement some of those uh, trainings and things that you might need in order to make these kind of career changes and moves that uh, you might be interested in. Um, so with that, I think, you know, in the interest of getting everyone out on time, um, I, I'm going to end this here. Um, I do want to thank you all for joining us today. Uh, thank you again to Julie for her wonderful insight and always just, uh, you know, very engaging presentations. I know oh, I learned every, every time I do these. So thank you so much. Um, as a reminder, we'll okay. be emailing the evaluations uh, tomorrow. Um, again, even if you aren't requesting CEs, we'd really appreciate any feedback. It really helps us to keep developing these programs and holding them for free. Um, 
And again, if we weren't able to answer any of your questions today or if anything comes up, please feel free to email us at cancerandcareers at cew.org. Um, and we will be sure to get the answers from you either from Julie or from some of our other resources. Again, thank you, Julie, and thank you all. And we will uh, have, we look forward to seeing you at future webinars. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye.